tuning in to this live Q&A roundtable. I am Melinda Langdon, Director of Communications here at the Ivy Brain Tumor Center, located at Barrow Neurological Institute in Phoenix, Arizona. I'm joined today by a panel of brain tumor experts who I will have introduce themselves in just a few moments. But first, I want to talk about why we're here today and what we plan on discussing. It's currently Brain Tumor Awareness Month. This is a month dedicated to raising awareness for a patient population that is often overlooked. But it is estimated that 700,000 Americans are currently living with a primary brain tumor. And approximately 85,000 more will be diagnosed in 2021 alone. For the most common malignant form of brain cancer, glioblastoma, there is currently only one FDA approved drug. And that was identified a few decades ago. Here at the Ivy Brain Tumor Center, it is our mission to rapidly identify new and effective treatments for brain cancer through the largest phase zero clinical trials program in the world. And that's what we're here to talk about today, clinical trials. We will be answering the most common questions surrounding clinical trials and the IV phase zero, clini phase zero clinical trial approach. We will also be talking about some of the more recent clinical trials that we have opened here at the Ivy Center within the past few months. So without further ado, let's go ahead and have the panel introduce themselves. We'll start at this end and work our way down. Uh, thanks, my, my name is Zama Mirzadeh. Um, I'm a neurosurgeon at the Ivy Brain Tumor Center here at the Bear Neurological Institute. Uh, I also uh, direct the metabolism core group um, uh, doing our uh, studies related to metabolism. Thank you. Hi, I'm Shwetal Mehta. I'm the Chief Operating Officer and Deputy Director of the Ivy Brain Tumor Center, and I also oversee the preclinical core. Mm -hmm. My name is Dr. Nader Sinai. I'm the Director of the Ivy Brain Tumor Center and the Director of Neurosurgical Oncology at the Barrow. My name is Charlene Robinson. I'm the Project Manager at the Ivy Brain Tumor Center, working on both preclinical and clinical projects. Great, perfect. Thank you all. Thank you for being here. Um, we do have a limited amount of time, so we're going to go ahead and jump in. Um, I do have a list of questions here that were either submitted to us through our website or through social media. Um, so we'll go through those, but for those of you who are tuning in live, thank you for being here. Um, if you have any questions as we move along, uh, please go ahead and ask those in the comments. If we're unable to answer them today during this time, we do plan on going back and replying to them within a couple of days. Um, and for those of you who are just tuning in, again, thank you for being here. I'm with a panel of brain tumor experts, and we are answering the most common questions surrounding clinical trials and the role that they play in identifying new effective treatment options for brain tumor patients. Um, so Dr. Sny, can you start us at the basics and describe what a phase zero or what a clinical trial is and the different phases of them? So for patients facing malignant brain tumors, they often have few options in terms of standard therapies. And those options oftentimes pass very quickly, and they're then faced with a scenario where their tumor is still progressing, but the standard therapies that were available to them are no longer of use, and there's nothing else on the horizon that's been proven effective. So that's where clinical trials and experimental therapies come in, where we as physicians and scientists try to find new therapeutic options that will change the direction of how the disease is being managed for these patients, give them new opportunities to treat it, and show the tumor new therapies that it hasn't seen before in hopes of getting a different outcome and getting it under control. Clinical trials are really the cornerstone of that effort, where 
and our experimental therapy is identified, it's given to patients, and then we follow the patients to see how they are doing and how they're responding to the therapy and how safe the therapy is. Now, clinical trials themselves come in different phases. The most conventional scaling of phases are phases one, two, and three, where a phase one clinical trial involves a therapy that's new and we're trying to see whether it's safe. We're not so focused on the efficacy of it. We just simply want to make sure patients aren't getting worse. A phase two clinical trial is where we know that the drug is safe and now we're trying to get an initial snapshot as to whether it has any effect in controlling the tumor. And a phase three, which is often referred to as a randomized clinical trial, is when one population of patients gets the drug, the other population of patients gets a placebo, and nobody knows who has what, and then we really see how the drug stacks up compared to a placebo and whether it's truly providing a benefit. Now at the Ivy Center, we focus on an additional phase to this scale, which is a phase zero clinical trial. And a phase zero clinical trial is really designed to identify much faster than these other phases which drugs are promising and which drugs are not. And in brain tumors in particular, there are two primary problems with any new therapy that we develop. The first is, does the drug actually get to the tumor? Because our brains are designed to keep things out. And that's good when you're healthy, but when you have a brain tumor and we want to get the drugs in, that's a big problem. And most new drugs today fail because they don't get to the tumor in sufficient quantities. The second problem with new drugs is that even when they do get there, they don't do what they're supposed to do at a molecular or genetic level to the tumor. So even despite our best efforts in engineering, when we actually give the drug to the patient, the effects are not what we expect them to be. And these are difficult to ascertain in a phase one, two, or three clinical trial. So a phase zero clinical trial very simply answers these simple questions. One, does the drug get there? Two, is it doing what it's supposed to be doing? And we answer these questions in a matter of days in a patient. So we know when the drug is going to be of promise and when we should really move on to other drugs. So in the landscape of brain tumor drug development, we think that this strategy in particular is essential for developing the landscape of therapies appropriately for our patients. It's really an opportunity to make sure that patients are getting something promising and make sure that we're not wasting time, which is their most precious commodity, as we all know, in terms of putting them on drugs that are not going to be effective and then hoping for an outcome that has no possibility of happening. Okay. Thank you. Um, so that leads me to another question about phase zero clinical trials because we had some, somebody submit a question. Um, they had done some research on what a phase zero clinical trial is. And they had read that the patient who enrolls in a phase zero clinical trial has no chance of benefiting from the drug that they're being put on. Dr. Mehta, can you speak to that and, and what it's like at the Ivy Brain Tumor Center for a patient on a phase zero clinical trial? Absolutely. So if, uh, um, as Dr. Sanai mentioned earlier, um, in a phase zero setting, we ask these two questions, whether the drug is getting to the tumor or not, and is it really hitting its target? If the answer to those two questions is yes, then the patient goes on to this expansion or phase two portion where they receive a therapeutic dosing of, of the drug. So the answer to your question is yes. Um, there is an option for the patients to benefit from, from these treatments. Okay, great, great. Um, okay, so just to switch gears a little bit and talk about some of the clinical trials that are being conducted here at the Ivy Center currently. Um, there's one that we've been receiving a lot of questions about. It's been generating some buzz, um, and it's a it's it's the study of sonodynamic therapy. Um, we recently opened the the first in human clinical trial here. Um, Dr. Snyt, can you tell us what it is about this study that's been generating so much interest, and and then maybe you can also explain what sonodynamic therapy is? Sure. So if you're a brain tumor patient today, or the family or caregiver of a brain tumor patient, you're already familiar with what we call the different modalities of treatment, the different categories of treatment. And it often begins with surgery, which is one modality, followed by 
chemotherapy, which today for most brain cancer patients is a single drug called temozolomide or temidar, which is a pill. And that chemotherapy is often given at the same time as radiation therapy. That's the third modality. And then for some patients after these therapies, they then get an electric magnetic cap that's placed on their head and they wear that most of the day. That's a device called Optune, uh, which is a category or modality of therapy called tumor treating fields. And all four of these modalities together are not curative, and most patients realize that today, but they can help prolong life, in some cases improve symptoms. But they're really not the solution, and that's why experimental therapies exist to build on that bridge and get us all the way across. So sonodynamic therapy is a fifth modality. It's not radiation, it's not a chemotherapy. It's really a combination of a drug and a device. And what's interesting is that the drug itself is benign. It really has no therapeutic effects by itself. Any patient could ingest it without really any side effects. And any brain tumor patient could ingest it without having any anti-tumor effects directly from the drug. But the drug takes advantage of the fact that brain cancers and most cancers don't metabolize things normally like normal cells do. So when a patient who, for example, has a glioblastoma, which as you mentioned is one of the most common malignant brain cancers we see in adults, when that patient ingests the drug, which is called 5-ALA, the trade name is called Sonala001, that drug goes into their system and their normal cells metabolize that drug and it becomes something inert and non-toxic. But cancer cells don't completely digest the drug and it starts to accumulate as a byproduct. And that byproduct itself is sensitive to getting activated. And the way it can get activated is through ultrasound energy. Now ultrasound, as we all know, is a relatively inert form of energy. Um, you can calibrate it, so it has no really detrimental effects by itself. But in this sonodynamic therapy strategy, patients go into an MRI unit that's been fitted with a special type of experimental ultrasound, and their brain tumors get targeted with this ultrasound energy. And by itself, the ultrasound energy has no effect on the brain tumors. But when that energy collides with this drug byproduct, there's a chemical reaction that occurs that is extremely toxic to the cell. And as a result of that chemical reaction, the tumor cells are killed and the normal cells are spared. And because this is not radiation, and so your brain receiving the ultrasound really has no detrimental effects that we've seen so far, and because the drug itself is benign, this is a therapy that potentially can be done over and over again. So at the Ivy Center, we've pioneered this first in human clinical trial, where for the first time in any patient with any cancer, we're giving this drug plus this targeted ultrasound therapy and administering what's called sonodynamic therapy. And that trial is ongoing, but you could understand why it's of tremendous interest, not only to patients, but to the whole brain tumor community, because we finally have a fifth lane to really go across. Um, and so this is what we're exploring at the Ivy Center. Thank you. And that leads me to ask you, Dr. Merzita, a question about the sonodynamic therapy and how uh, once a patient ex goes under the treatment, how we are then identifying if how the treatment is effective or not. Um, you know, after surgery and everything, sure. what we're looking at. Sure, yeah. So the, the way the trial is done, um, because of the way we're combining the drug and the device, it actually lets us ask this question in a way we can't with a lot of other drugs. And that's because we can target the ultrasound waves to part of their tumor, and the rest of their tumor only has seen the drug, but not the ultrasound waves. So we can directly compare what is the effect of sonodynamic therapy, meaning the device plus the drug, and how does that compare to just getting the drug, which as Dr. Sinai said, is in and of itself inert and really doesn't do anything. Um, and, so, and so that's kind of a, a nice way where we really get to see exactly what, what the uh, device and the drug together are doing. And 
to kind of extend, extend on what Dr. Sinai said, what I'd say is, you know, radiation is not something that you can give to the whole brain, right? It has detrimental effects. Um, so if this were to become, uh, if, if we could show that this drug device target really has beneficial effect, it's potentially something you really could give to a large part of the brain because again, the ultrasound by itself is not detrimental. The drug by itself is not detrimental. It's really that, that combination wherever those two happen together where you get this um, anti-tumor effect. And so we can target tumor in places we don't necessarily see it, which is part of the problem with brain cancer. Okay, thank you, it's fascinating. Um, Charlene, you uh, are a big part of our clinical operations team here at the IV Center. Um, can you talk a little bit about a patient, what the patient experience is like for someone who may be interested in this study and finding out if they're eligible for it, and then once they are, can you talk us through what that patient experience looks like when they participate in the sonodynamic therapy? Of course, absolutely. Um, the first and foremost piece is that there's always going to be a member of the study team alongside our patients while they're on this trial journey. Um, so it's really important to us that our patients have this positive experience with a member of the study team. Um, once the patient has been tested um, for eligibility or has determined to be eligible for the trial, they will sign a consent form for the trial and then they'll participate in a brief screening visit um, for the sonody sonodynamic therapy trial specifically. Um, if the study is a good option for them, then they'll move on to a visit that starts very early in the morning, but this is the day where they receive the treatment. So early in the morning, we receive the drug, and then about six to seven hours later, they'll be treated with the sonodynamic therapy. Um, and then about 12 hours after they had received the drug, their visit will end. Um, Throughout that day, the nurses, the study nurses that will be working with them will be taking blood samples and those blood samples will actually be used to check the drug levels uh, over, the, over that day, over the duration of the day. Um, so following that visit and between their surgery, every day one of our neuro-oncologists will be reaching out to them by phone to check in on the patient to make sure they're feeling okay. Um, and then before their surgery, they will have a pre-surgical visit. Of course, their scheduled surgery will take place. And about one to two weeks following surgery, they'll have a safety follow-up visit with a member of our study team. And then about a month after their treatment visit, they'll receive another safety follow-up. So safety is very important for us to monitor as well as the positive experience our patients will have. Um, but yeah, that's really the experience that they'll have. And like I said, a member of our, our study team will be with them every step of the way. Great, thank you. Um, okay, so that's great. Is there anything else anyone wants to mention about sonodynamic therapy? So one of the idiosyncrasies of that particular trial is that the ultrasound that's administered only works when there aren't any barriers between the ultrasound device and the patient's scalp. So this is a unique trial from a patient experience standpoint because we have to shave the patient's head the morning of surgery. And um, once that head, head is shaven, the patient's head is put into what we call a stereotactic frame. For patients who have had radio surgery with devices like Gamma Knife, it's a very familiar experience, but effectively there is a metal crown that's fixated to the patient's head at four points with local anesthetic. That's administered by the neurosurgeon. And at this point, the patient's head is shaven. And then there is a rubber barrier that's put around the circumference of the scalp. And that rubber barrier goes right up against the scalp itself. And the reason for that is because the rubber barrier is filled with water. So the entire top half of your head is bathed in water as you're in the ultrasound device, which is a strange sensation, but not uncomfortable. Um, but it's an important feature for patients to understand because we understand the importance of hair and hair loss. Um, the fact that um, for some patients, this can be a difficult thing to go through. Um, but 
we only do it because it's essential in order for the mechanics of the ultrasound to work effectively. Okay, great. Now, um, do you have any idea when we plan on releasing information on the effectiveness of this study? Like when, when will patients be able to learn about how it's working? The results of the study will be basically distributed as soon as they're available. We think that over the summer of 2021, there's going to be at least one early publication um, on the feasibility and safety of the strategy. And then our intention is to complete this trial over that summer and then report the complete results in the fall at one of several international neuro-oncology brain tumor meetings. Okay. And then what would be on the horizon from there for this type of modality? Well, the initial step always is to prove feasibility and safety. And we believe that uh, the study that we're currently doing will be completed this summer in order to establish that. Uh, our intention and our responsibility to our patients is then, if the strategy ap appears to be feasible and practical, um, to expand the clinical trial to a larger population of patients, uh, both in numbers, but also in terms of the varieties of tumors and patterns of tumor recurrences they have. So we expect to open that follow-on study sometime this summer, and certainly uh, that will make it a lot easier for as many patients to access it as they would like. Okay, great. So speaking of access, that um, kind of leads us into the next question, which is around another study that opened earlier this year. Um, and this is the study of pomiparib. Um, and the historic nature of that one is that um, prior to this study, all of the IV brain tumor centers phase zero clinical trials had been just for um, recurrent glioblastoma patients. But in this particular study, um, we are able to enroll both newly diagnosed and recurrent glioblastoma patients. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that study and why we're able to enroll newly diagnosed patients in it? So one of the complexities of a phase zero clinical trial is that um, we need to have a comparison. If we're giving a patient a drug and we're asking ourselves, how is the drug changing the tumor? We have to ask ourselves, changing it compared to when? So up until now, phase zero clinical trials at our center and at any center that tries to do them have focused on recurrent patients, recurrent tumors in patients. And the reason is because those patients have had a prior operation. So we have their tumor tissue from the prior operation as a comparator. And that lends itself to treating the recurrent patient population. But of course, we understand that, number one, um, patients need help with new therapies even at initial diagnosis because we know that those therapies at initial diagnosis are not curative. Number two, many times tumors are more treatable at initial diagnosis than they are at recurrence. When tumors recur, they've already demonstrated their ability to evade many therapies, so they're sort of battle-hardened by the experience, and that makes it even more difficult for specialists like us to find the right therapies. So going earlier into the evolution of the tumor gives us a greater opportunity. So for all those reasons, we've developed strategies to do these types of trials in what we call the upfront setting, meaning at initial diagnosis. And the pomiparib study, as you alluded to, is the first phase zero study to ever be done in the upfront setting. Now, um, the drug itself is an interesting new class of drugs. Uh, that drug is developed by a company called Beijing. And this class of drugs is designed to improve the efficacy of radiotherapy. Now, radiation therapy is arguably the most effective treatment there is for brain cancer. I mentioned the four modalities, surgery, chemotherapy, radiation therapy, and tumor treating fields. But amongst those four, radiation therapy seems to be the most effective in terms of the overall survival benefit and also the most generalizable. Worldwide, we estimate that there's about 300,000 patients a year diagnosed with some sort of primary brain cancer. And worldwide, there are different levels of access to care, different levels of specialization of medical centers, specialized neurosurgeons like myself and Dr. Mirzadeh, specialized neuroscientists like 
Dr. Mehta. And so access to these modalities varies, but what is available to the most number of patients worldwide is radiation therapy. So enhancing the effects of radiation therapy is a very important and worthwhile endeavor. And this is why we have multiple trials in development to do exactly that. And the Pimipirib trial is unique in that for patients who are newly diagnosed or recurrent, they can get this drug in combination with radiotherapy. And at newly diagnosis, they can get it even instead of the existing chemotherapy that has very little effect for many patients. Okay, thank you. Dr. Mehta, can you talk about how we identify who is, for a newly diagnosed patient, how they're eligible for this? Yeah, as Dr. Sanai just alluded earlier, that a certain specific population of patients um, do not respond that well to temozolomide. And this patient population is usually characterized by what is called the MGMT unmethylated group. So when patients get their genetic testing done for the tumors, um, they would see a report and where it would state whether it's MGMT methylated or unmethylated. And what that means um, is when you have an MGMT methylated uh, diagnosis, um, these patients are not making enough of this enzyme called MGMT. Uh, what does that to do to your tumor? These tumors now don't, don't have the capacity to fix the damage that temozolomide would generate um, and hence be responsive. So if the patient's tumors are MGMT unmethylated, they're making a lot of this MGMT enzyme um, and are not gonna be responsive to temozolomide. Now that's the patient population which we would enroll in our pemipirib trial um, and where they can take pemipirib instead of temozolomide in combination with radiation. Okay, okay, great. So, um, you know, you talk about us looking at the genetics and like the genetic testing of the brain tumors. Um, you talked about archival tissue um, from a previous surgery. Um, can you talk about the precision medicine aspect of the IV center um, and then how we use that to match patients to specific drugs that we're testing on, on various clinical trials here? Yeah, so for every patient that we um, try to enroll into our phase zero trials, either we obtain their um, tissue from the prior surgery in recurrent cases, um, and at times, for, even for the newly diagnosed cases, we would get tissue from, if they've had a needle biopsy done, uh, we would receive that tissue. That tissue gets sent back to the lab, and we ask whether the, the tumor tissue has the right mutations, right aberrations, that would you know, predict that these tumors would respond to the drug that we are testing. Um, and based on that, the patient would get enrolled in the appropriate trials that are ongoing right now. Okay, okay. Um, so there is another study that we have going on that is targeting a very specific genetic mutation um, that only exists in, I think it's like 5% of glioblastoma patients. Um, Dr. Sai, do you want to talk about that study? Sure. So brain cancer therapies have been very difficult to develop in the last 30 years. And as you mentioned, there really is only one chemotherapy today with a survival benefit that was introduced to the community about 20 years ago. One of the clarities of the field is that a single drug will likely never be sufficiently effective to control this disease. And that's why the majority of the drugs and strategies in the IV Center portfolio are combinations. Drugs combined with drugs. Drugs combined with different modalities like radiotherapy. Drugs combined with devices. Uh, we're under no illusion that a single drug can be sufficiently effective. But there are, also, there are some caveats to that statement. And one caveat that we know from the field of medical oncology is that some tumors are uniquely addicted to a certain mechanism. Tumors develop because certain genes mutate, and those genes are what we call oncogenes, which are genes that lead to cancer. And in complicated cancers, like pancreatic cancer or glioblastoma, there are many, many genes that are mutated, and there's no one mutation that's driving the disease. That's why these cancers are so complicated to deal with. Other cancers that are driven by a single genetic malformation, for example, are actually quite treatable. 
So for example, certain forms of leukemia and lymphoma. However, um, as you mentioned, there's a small subset of patients with glioblastoma that have a unique mutation called an oncogene fusion. And the technical term for it is FGFR TAC3 fusions. And these are rare, but when they occur, there's evidence that these tumors are uniquely addicted to that mechanism. And so we have found a drug in partnership with QED Therapeutics, which is called infogratinib, a cancer drug that's in development for gallbladder cancer, which also has FGFR category mutations, but a drug that we think is uniquely suited for this subset of glioblastoma patients. So for the 5% of patients out there with an FGFR TAC3 fusion, this is the only clinical trial worldwide that specifically targets that chink in the armor. And of course, we're using a phase zero strategy for it, which means that these patients, once identified, will receive a brief several day exposure to the drug before surgery, will then confirm that the drug is getting there and hitting its FGFR TAC3 target. And then if the answer to both of those questions is yes, the patient will then go on the drug long-term and we'll see how well it can control their disease. Okay, okay. So we will see how long and if it controls their disease. If a patient who's on one of our clinical trials here at the IV Center then has a recurrence while they're on a current trial, are they then able to enroll in another clinical trial that's happening here at the IV Center? Absolutely. So one of the strategies for our entire drug development portfolio is to give patients multiple bites at the apple. We don't want to put patients on drugs long term that are either never going to work or not going to work sufficiently. So the moment there's any evidence that the drug has lost its efficacy, we try to make it very easy to pivot to the next clinical trial. And we have patients that to date have been on three or four phase zero trials in succession each time showing that tumor a different look, each time applying pressure in a different way in order to continuously stress it and put it on its heels. So there's nothing that precludes a patient from going on to multiple trials, phase zero or otherwise. Okay, okay. Um, Charlene, can you talk a little bit about if a patient's interested in participating in any of the studies that we've talked about today or any of the other studies that we have listed, listed on our website, um, how can they go about finding out if they're eligible for one of our trials? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one way is they are welcome to just give us a call and speak directly with one of our phase zero clinical trial navigators. Um, they can also fill out a form on our website that uh, determines trial eligibility, and that gets submitted off to our, our phase zero navigators as well. Um, about two to three business days, maybe, if not sooner, of course, um, our, our navigators will contact that patient and discuss next steps, um, potential trials that they could be eligible for based off of the information they've provided. Um, and then depending on whether or not they meet uh, minimum criteria, they may be asked to review a consent form. Um, once they've reviewed that consent form with a member of the study team, uh, if they do agree to continue on, we will actually request the archival tissue that you've mentioned earlier. Um, and that's where we'll start testing for those genetic markers to see which trial could be a potential for them. Um, and then from there, we'll contact them and, you know, uh, begin the trial enrollment process. Okay. Um, now, what if a patient doesn't qualify for a study today, but, you know, they're interested in, in maybe us following along on their case um, to, to learn if they are eligible in the future? Of course, we actually do follow our patients um, and we try to keep an eye on them and see how they're doing. And if in the future they happen to have a recurrence, um, we will contact them or they'll contact us, you know, but we do follow them and we will test that tissue again. And we'll just make sure that if there is an opportunity for them to be on one of our trials, we want them to be aware of that. 
uh, it's very important for us to make sure that those patients are followed and, and watched in case they, they could have an opportunity with us. Okay, great. Um, another question that we often get asked on social media um, is, you know, there may be somebody who is, you know, somewhere else in the world. They don't, they don't live right here in Phoenix, Arizona, um, and they're interested in participating in one of our trials. Um, can someone participate in an IV phase zero clinical trial if they don't live here? Absolutely. So 40% of our patients come from out of state, and a subset of those come from out of country. So uh, we live in a world where patients and their physicians are really casting a wide net in terms of therapeutic options. We try to make that as easy as possible. Whether a patient's out of state, out of country, we have navigators, as Charlene mentioned, who can chaperone them through the process, including the process of coming into the country. Um, and at the same time, we try to design our trials so that we're not monopolizing patients' time and requiring them to move to Arizona or spend a prolonged period of time in Phoenix. Instead, we try to make everything as efficient as possible so that their stay here is brief and that their return to their home environment, which is always the best place to heal and to recover, and that their return to their home physicians, which we partner with, whether it's a neuro-oncologist, a neurosurgeon, a radiation oncologist, a medical oncologist, or all of the above, we keep them all in the loop it's a collaborative team. They're part of our trial protocol as much as anyone else is here. And so when they go home, when that patient goes home, we really partner with those physicians to continue the therapies, if that's the case, as well as continuing the monitoring wherever their home institution is. Okay, okay, great. Um, and then as far as the time that they would need to be here in Phoenix, do you, can you provide that type of information? Is it specific to the trial that they're on? It is, because each trial, as we've heard, has a different strategy, and that strategy requires different things of us and of the patient. In ballpark terms, though, we're looking at stays that are in the range of one to two weeks. It all depends upon the nuances of the trial, the results of the trial, and all of the things that go in between. But we're really trying to limit the amount of time they need to physically be here, because as Charlene mentioned, so much of our monitoring can be done remotely these days. We don't need them to be here for a very long period of time. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, I have just a couple more questions here. I know we're kind of coming to the end of our time here together. Um, one question is, is a broad one, but I'm hoping that maybe a couple of you could answer it. Um, what's on the horizon for patients at the IV Center? I can go. Um, as we talked earlier about the radiation sensitizing drugs, um, we have several other drugs in addition to pimiprib that are upcoming. Um, similar mechanism of increasing the efficacy of radiation um, is something that we are very excited about. Um, the other, st other um, trials that are in the pipeline are also expanding on what we've known um, from previous studies. Um, how can we take from the phase zero to, to the next level of maybe expanding it to randomized trials? Um, and I can let others talk. Yeah, I think to, to echo Dr. Mehta's points, there are sort of four horizons that we see coming at us. The first is combination drug approaches, uh, of which we have many in development and in trial. Um, that's all about identifying drugs that work identifying how tumors become resistant to those drugs and then pairing them with other drugs that undermine that resistance. It's actually, unfortunately, very uncommon to have dual drug clinical trials in our field, but we've managed to almost exclusively focus on that. The second element on the horizon has to do with what we termed as sonodynamic therapy, with, which in a broader context is what's called metabolic targeting exploiting the metabolic vulnerabilities of cancer. And we mentioned one with a drug called Sonala001, which is an, a trade name for an IV formulation of 5 amino levulinic acid. But we have other strategies in development to pursue sonodynamic therapy with other drugs. The third horizon really has to do with, as Dr. Mehta mentioned, radiation, sensitization, and synergy with radiation. And in that category, 
there is a whole stable of new drug classes that we think can exploit exactly that. And we are working diligently to basically represent every element of that stable in our portfolio. And finally, I think for any cancer patient today, immunotherapy is very top of mind. And we've seen amazing results with immunotherapy in other cancers, like certain subtypes of lung cancer, certain subtypes of skin cancer. And to date, immunotherapy has been pursued with a lot of enthusiasm by both the industry and the field in neuro-oncology, meaning in brain cancer patients. And to date, there has not been a single positive trial yet, even though many different combinations have been pursued. And more recently, a variation of immunotherapy called CAR-T therapy, where you develop specialized cells that are designed to really home in on the tumor and use immune mechanisms to kill them. But even with all of these strategies, we have yet to see any positive results so the Ivy Center is monitoring all this very carefully. We're going to pick and choose our moments to pursue immunotherapy in the context of a phase zero clinical trial. But the field right now is still a bit immature in terms of understanding why these therapies are not working. Many people in the field believe that it has to do with the fact that these tumors are solid masses. And a lot of times, activating the immune response to get into a solid mass is difficult, whereas in other cancers, it's a little easier. And at the same time, the brain is not only designed to keep things out of it, but it's actually designed to not have a very robust immune response. And as a consequence, revving up the immune cells in the brain is not as easy as it is in the rest of the body. Okay. Thank you. So before we wrap up today, um, I do have just one last question that I'd like to ask each of you. Um, and the question is, you know, we have brain tumor patients and their families, their loved ones watching today. Some of them have either been in this fight for um, a year or two now, or they may just be at the early stages of their fight um, against brain cancer. What would you want these brain tumor patients to know about participating in a clinical trial and the work happening here at the IV Center? Dr. Merzita, do you want to take it away? Uh, sure, I can start. Um, you know, I think, um, as you've heard, uh, today, um, the, the Ivy Center, you know, is a group of experts, all different fields. And so, and we're all just approaching this problem of brain cancer and how can we come up with a, a better therapy for brain cancer patients. And so, and that's all we do. We are not a, a, we're not a cancer center that treats many different types of cancer. We are a cancer center that just treats brain cancer. And so w with that, you get a certain level of specialization and precision and everybody all focused on a single problem. Um, and so, you know, you have this expertise represented on this panel. The expertise of the center goes far beyond that. And what each person brings to the table is something different that's gonna be targeting this overall mission of coming up with better treatments for brain cancer. So, um, you know, as, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a son of a, uh, a patient who had a, a, a GBM. Uh, my mother had a GBM and passed away from it. And so if I put my hat on from that side of it, when I was on that side of it, you know, I think there's, there's two things. One, you have a center that's entirely focused on this disease. And so no one's thinking harder and more about it than we are. But on the other side, the other thing that you heard today is all of the trials are designed with the much more um, sort of practical ground level of how is this patient gonna get through this trial and what is best for this patient. So there's this high level, let's treat brain cancer overall. And then there's this ground level of, let's get each patient through the trial or the best trial for them. And that's something that's thought of at the ground level. So that's, that's something we consider into the design of the trials. So how is this gonna work for patient X? And, and let's make sure that the way we design the trial is, is kind of optimizing that experience. And, and hopefully you, you kind of, you, you heard that today, um, that, that, that it's all encompassing the, the treatment that a patient gets here, so. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Dr. Mehta, what would you like patients and their families to know? Yeah, so I, I think I'd, I'd like to make two points. Um, one, um, echoing what Dr. Mirza, they just said that um, at the IV Center, the, the clinical trials that we do here um, provides 
patients with these answers on whether the drug is actually reaching their tumors, whether it's really hitting the target or not. And if the answer to those two questions, yes, they go on to receiving that drug, knowing that this drug is actually getting there and doing what it's supposed to do. Um, if the answer is no, within a few days, within, they are able to pivot and switch on to some, some other trial that's gonna work for them, uh, which saves time. And second, just enrolling in clinical trial has this larger um, impact uh, on the community. We, with every trial, we learn something new of how to improve the process, which drugs to bring in, which cocktail of drugs to mix. Um, so they're helping in, in that larger cause by enrolling in, in these trials. And, and again, as Dr. Mirza Day alluded, it's very personal year for several members um, at the Ivy Center, so. Dr. Sinai, what would you add? So the Ivy Center is a nonprofit. We don't have a dog in this race. We are not paid by the pharmaceutical industry. Um, the success or failure of the drugs does not equate to our bottom line. Um, and I say that because it's important to understand that the motivation for the Ivy Center was born exclusively out of our frustration on behalf of our patients with the lack of progress in the field. The need for a greater sense of urgency, for more creativity, and for more direct lines to solutions. And that perspective, as, as you've heard from some of these other panel members, is a personal one as well as a professional one. Many of us have dealt with very directly the battles of brain cancer and many of us have been part of losses in those battles. So we not only understand the patient's perspective, but also the family, the caregiver perspective, the survivor perspective, and the need for all of them to not only have therapeutic options that provide hope, which is so critical to enduring a battle with brain cancer or a family member's battle with brain cancer, but also really to have an opportunity to change the reality for everyone else, everyone that's going to be coming after you. Um, so we have taken this upon ourselves very seriously. For us, this is an existential battle. We live it every day with our patients. And from our perspective, we won't rest until we identify new things that work, new therapeutic options that change the reality for our patients and their families. And that's our commitment to them. So well said. Thank you, Dr. Sinai. Charlene, would you like to add anything? Um, yes. I mean, of course, in addition to what everyone else on the panel has said, um, I think it's also important that we note that the patient's experience with us is very important to us as well. Um, it's something that we really keep an eye on, and we ensure that our patients are cared for and they know that they're cared for from when they reach out to us on to whether or not they're eligible for a trial, speaking with our phase zero navigators, to when they're working with our extraordinary research nurses throughout the duration of their participation. Um, and then even to us monitoring them following their participation uh, to ensure that they're safe and you know if there's potential for future participation. So that experience to us is also very important because it's not an easy time for them. So if we can make it a little bit easier on them, that, that means a lot to us. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you all for participating in this panel today. That's all we have time for today. Um, but we hope you, the viewers, have a better understanding of the important role that clinical trials play in the treatment of brain tumors and the advancement of new treatment options for brain cancer. Um, if you asked a question in the comments and we were unable to get to it, like I said, we do plan on going back and replying to those within the next couple of days. Um, and we are on social media, um, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, so please Find us there and follow us and engage with us. We'd love to hear from you. Um, and for more information about the IV Brain Tumor Center and our phase zero clinical trials, you can go to ivbraintumorcenter.org. Thank you again for joining us. Have a great day.